Hello, everyone. Welcome to lecture eight. So let's get started. So as always, uh, some announcements first, and we'll be recapping a few concepts that we discussed in the last lecture. In today's lecture, we'll be mainly discussing transformer, which is the 2017 paper, seminal paper, and probably we'll be going into a lot of details. And in the next, next lecture, we'll be going through more of a, today's more about the concept or mathematical, I would say, formulations. And in the next lecture, we'll be using the annotate transformer to go through the code-wise details and I just wanted, wanted to say that, uh, so I think it really depends uh, when the class is, when the lecture is taken, but I think uh, Transformer is relatively really recent work compared to what we have discussed until now. That's why we're going into much more details. And also of course it's a seminal work. Of course, maybe in a few years, you know, maybe it's, there is something that better than or more universal than transformer comes out, then probably will not be going into much details when that time comes, right? So hopefully um, you understand why we have a different emphasis on different kinds of, kinds of work, especially depending on the time and also its importance at the current time. But yeah, it's really hard to um, overemphasize the importance of transformer at this period of time in NLP. Okay, so announcements. Actually, I have a lot of a lot of announcements today. First, assignment one is due on Wednesday, 11 p.m. So please make sure to submit. Some of the problems could be challenging, but many of them are also very, uh, I would say, relatively easy. So even if they are really hard, try them at least. Read, read the questions and you will see it's not um, as hard as you thought. And number two, so actually I was not clear about this. And also I had some communication with the uh, with neighbor uh, uh, about the uh, how I should be grading the neighbor students. So I, I think initially I said that there, I think in the first lecture I mentioned that there are a few students from neighbor who are taking this class. And I said they're auditing. Auditing means that there is no grading, but it turns out that there is actually a grade that I should give to neighbor students. So please visit this website. It's also on the, uh, there is a link from the class website too. So please take a look. In short, basically neighbor students will be will be responsible for about half of the work that regular students do for uh, regular chi st students do. So, which is you, you can choose to either do three assignments and no final project or one assignment and do the final project. And for the final project, if you're working on NLP project already, then you're free to use that for your submission. And you will need to have at least 70% final grade the grading will be in the same standard as the uh, regular KAIST students to pass the class. So please let me know if you have any question. And also I have uploaded the form there that you can submit your assignment once in case you already worked on it. Because all the assignments for KAIST students are being submitted through the KAIST portal, KLMS, but neighbor students don't have the access to that. So please use the Google form on the, this post. So please visit there and then you can take a look. And yeah, please ask me right now in case you have questions. Yeah, I'll be um, ask, answering the questions during the class in case you didn't know, yeah. So, and number three is that assignment two will be released on Wednesday. So yeah, you will have to work on it right, right after your assignment one. It will be about token classification model for MRC. 
which is basically lectures from probably 05 to 07, last lecture, you'll be asked to use attention mechanism. There will be some bonus points for using transformer only model, but other than that, it, it actually covers a bit of lecture eight too, my bad. So it will be a, mostly lecture five to lecture eight. I think that's more accurate to say. So today's lecture will be also, and next lecture will be actually also relevant. So please keep that in mind. So I think five to nine, yeah, I would say something like that. And doing assignment two correctly will be very important for the final project because uh, the final project will be about creating an open domain query system. And it's it consists of retrieval model that searches the documents and the reading comprehension model that gets the answer. So basically doing assignment two correct, correctly will be basically the half of the final project. So please yeah, keep that in mind, especially if you're a neighbor student, then probably you want to work on assignment two if you're thinking about doing the final project. And also remember that you can choose to work on your own project if it is NLP related. So this is especially encouraged if you're working on NLP paper right now, I mean, submitting to a conference, and then um, I don't want you to work on two, two different things um, when you're working on the conference paper. So you can make that into your submission. You probably, you can just submit your um, draft paper, I think in that case, unless it's not super NLP related. Then in that case, then you will need to really consult with me to get an approval. And just your email should just contain a short description of your project. And I'll let you know if that's appropriate uh, to re replace the final project. So any questions? Okay. Oh, well, yeah, but um, so it can be a team project. I mean, I mean, it can be a team project if you're working on your own project that you're submitting a paper to. So I think it's not like you can work. I mean, um, can you email me with the details? Then I will actually uh, talk to you. So in general, I don't recommend team project. But then if it's like a, you're working on conference paper, for instance, and then if it is already a team project, then yes. But then in that case, then you have, it has to be clear that what your contributions are compared to other people. So I think that's what I wanted to make sure. It's not like a, uh, you can work on open domain QA system together, um, unless you have a really good reason to do so. But so um, I will not say you cannot do that, but I don't recommend. And if you think it would be much better to work in a team, then please email me. So maybe for instance, you are really new to NLP and you don't want to, but you can be helpful in some part of the final project. Then in that case, then I think doing a, doing a project as a team makes sense. But if you're just, because I, I think team project, the reason why I kind of discourage it is because in many cases, when you're doing team project, one person does everything and other people just like, you know, kind of don't do much. I'm not saying that's of course uh, always a case, but I think that happens a lot. So I don't want it to happen. And also um, I want everyone to learn. Uh, this is like a more of a, you know, something that um, I hope that everyone who wants to study at NLP to learn, but but I mean, I don't want to also, you know, make too much restrictions how you do this. So let me know, please um, email me about the details. And so reason why you think it's good to do it as a team project, then in that case, then I'll give you an approval that you can work as a team. Okay. Okay, so if does anyone else have questions? All right, so let me know in any any time if you have a question.
so let's do a recap first. So we discussed this in the last lecture that the encoder decoder framework use an RNN to encode the input sentence into summary vector C, which is here the last hidden state of the RNN. And we mentioned that, so this encoding stage creates C and we use this as an input to every RNN in the decoder side to create the word embedding that you're decoding into as the output. Of course, you can only create one at a time. So basically in the, your first time step, you create your first output word, and then you feed that first output word as an input to the next time step and create the next output word and so on. And in this paper, Treadall used a GRU instead of LSTM. You can think of it as a simplified version of LSTM. And I think I mentioned a few details. For instance, this kind of training method is called teacher forcing that you're giving the um, ground truth next word as the, I would say, um, the, um, the target to be trained on. So it's basically, you're essentially, so when you're training the output decoder, you have RNN, right? And you basically give start token and the token number one comes out. So this is like a first word and first word goes in and you're trying to predict that into second word and second word goes in and third word. And of course, during training time, you know what these uh, W1, W2 are, because of course, you know what you're trying to train the model into, you're basically labels. So in machine translation, these will be the, uh, the target sentence. Then you basically just put that in as the input with the one, um, I would say, you're shifting the, the position of words by one you're increasing the position by one so that you can put the start token at the top position, first position, right? So that you can be always predicting the next word. But during inference time, you're decoding, you should actually fit in the first, the, the word from the previous, previous output, right? Because you don't know what the word will be. So it'll be sequential decoding. Just trying to re-explain how this works. So then, Teacher forcing is exactly how you give the, the give the loss by comparing the RNN's output with the, the real output at each time step. And that's very strong supervision that makes the model work. But one thing that you might want to know at some point, probably not in this class, but when you do more advanced machine learning or NLP, then something that you need to be careful about is that teacher forcing is not unbiased estimator because your unbiased estimator should be unbiased with respect to the final output. But then in this case, you are just being unbiased with respect to each output, but as a whole, it's, it's actually biased. But this much has less variance than for instance, using um, something like policy gradient to make it um, exactly unbiased. So the point I wanna make is that um, these are really details that you can get into um, and in many cases, empirical, I mean, theoretical evidence is probably more favorable to things like policy gradient or reinforcement learning that gives you very exact, um, very unbiased gradient, but has super high variance that they have very, they don't really work well. And empirically, even if the, the loss is biased, you will have much better training, uh, say, efficiency. So that's why teacher forcing is like very dominant and it's very strong supervision basically. And, uh, but another issue with the encoder decoder is that really the big issue is that this, ha this has a bottleneck problem. So what that means is that the vector C has to contain the information about the input sentence entirely. That was the, um, the biggest problem. So in, uh, in other words, you can think of it as this way. 
you basically try to encode everything up to that time step when you're using RNN. So something like if you we use unidirectional RNN, then um, at this H2, then we're hoping that H2 contains the information up to time step two. So at HT, then you're hoping that you contain every information from time step from one to T. And you're hoping that the vector is very meaningful enough and very um, informative enough to do your target task, but it turns out it doesn't. And it's really hard to contain the entire sentences information in a single vector, even if it's really large. There are several reasons. It's not just because of uh, uh, information theoretical issues. I mean, theoretically, of course, even if if you increase the dimension size, then theoretically you can, you will have a larger capacity than the sentence, then it might be possible, but in reality, it's really hard to encode in, in meaning in that single vector. So that was why we got into the attention mechanism that was originally used in machine translation that basically performed the attention from decoder to uh, encoder in a sense that you cannot just look at the final vector to get the meaning of the input, but you have to actually have a direct access to the input to the to really understand the full meaning of the input and use that utilize that during decoding time. And this is like basically kind of similar to memory access. But then the issue is that if you just try to access it, it will be non-differentiable because you're performing argmax, right? So we try to approximate that with soft attention mechanism for differentiability. Although um, it's worth noting that in reality, it's not just about differentiability, but soft attention mechanism allows us to focus on more than one part of the sentence. Not many though, because softmax is very um, designed to be very, I would say, spiky. It cannot be, you know, very smooth. So it's very designed to be very focusing on one part of the sentence, which means that the values, if they're different by a very small number, then their difference in the softmax becomes much larger due to the exponentiation in the softmax. But people try to um, move, uh, move around with that using a temperature, for instance, like gumbo softmax. One example is that you're basically trying to soften the softmax with some temperature. You're dividing some number you're dividing the exponentiation by some number, but that's like out of scope either. So just FYI. And another way of looking at it is that um, you're basically dynamically summarizing decoding step. And we also mentioned that that we are in this case, we are performing attention from decoder to encoder so that we can access the encoder information directly without summarizing. But that same at that same the same thing holds true when during the encoding time, especially if the document is long enough, right? Even even if the document is not long, even if it's as short as a single sentence, this is also true. So that's why we want to also perform attention on the encoder side. And you can think of it as bottleneck problem also happens during encoding time because as I mentioned, for instance, let's say this is super long. And no, sorry. This, we're assuming that the if we, we use the LSTM or RNN variants, we're assuming that each time step hidden state contains all the information up to that time step. But if this is relatively long, then we cannot be sure if this information, HT minus one or HT, will be informative enough of the inputs. So we see that the same problem happens in the uh, in encoder side too. And that's why we need to do attention on itself, which is called self-attention, right? And 
we mentioned that in self attention was being i would say it was basically being explored in early 2017 or late 2016 i would say and at that time more of a parallelly transformer was being developed at google for machine translation there were largely two reasons i would say one is that the so i think th this is an interesting story from google that so back then google was moving from gpus to tpus so it was like 2017 was like one of the first years that google was able to put create tpus and use that for research within the company first and then I'm not sure how it is right now, but back then, because it was early stage, just like GPUs, there was no dedicated library for RNNs, recurrent neural networks. So everything was really about CNN or matrix multiplication. RNNs require really highly optimized library to actually make it work. And it is also believed that basically that environment, the fact that the, you had limitations of what you can use in the company was basically driving this research too, because perhaps they, it was not just that they wanted to remove RNNs, but it was more about they could not put the RNNs on TPUs and they had a lot of TPUs to work on. So that was like really, I think uh, one really reason. Other was that RNNs are very sequential. They, they have, they, they depend on the, 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 in order to compute time step t, you have to compute t minus one first. So it's very sequential. It cannot be parallelized. That's like really the, dip, the worst thing about RNN that if you have a long enough sequence to put on RNN, then it becomes very slow during training or inference time using GPUs. So given that it was clear that they wanted to remove RNNs, um, they thought, I think, removing RNN was the future if possible. But I think many people thought that's impossible, um, at least people thought that way before the transformer was released that the RNNs, they, people thought that, I think, I think I, I was one of them too, probably, but um, RNN is like, a, I mean, I think probably like most people, right? Uh, RNN is like super, it's like definitely necessary for an NLP model to work, but it turns out that it was not in many, I mean, it, it was proven, right? So, the transformer only uses self-attention. And one of the reasons that they could actually get away with the RNNs was the, the, the multi-head attention mechanism that they proposed. So we'll take, take a closer look at, into that in today's lecture. <clears throat> and during decoding time, they also use attention and there is a unidirectional attention. We'll be talking about that too. And basically all these characteristics enabled the model to be scaled up and simplified. It's very, I think, important shift in the community because scaling up is definitely like one of the, really the thing that people, you know, are all people agree with, but I think simplification is something that's more subtle, but I think it's really important because simplifying the model enables us to focus on other things like scaling up, or maybe data or more other things that's actually more important. So by simplifying the model and persuading people that it actually works is basically telling us that, okay, it's no more um, model centric or everything is really about model design. I mean, because back then it was the case, like people were thinking that okay, you, have to, you have to design a super complicated model to create a good, good engine or good, I would say, um, something that works well. And in other words, you're basically giving more inductive bias into the model. But it turns out that if you have enough data and in enough GPUs to compute, then it looks like these inductive biases are not so necessary, but they can be all learned from data. So that basically shifts the paradigm, I think, in 2017 because I think it's quite clear now too, because people still use transformer. I mean, they have modified that a bit, but it's not too different from it. And these days, if you read papers from these days compared to like say three to four years ago, 
or like five years ago. The key difference is that like five years ago, you will see a lot of mathematical notations to explain the model. And basically those are the inductive biases that people put into. But these days, like for instance, BERT, go look at the paper BERT, if you know what BERT is, then you will see that there are very little number of a uh, small number of mathematical equations, if any, because there's nothing to really explain about the model. Model is like just transformer, why not? With some minor tweaks. But the more focus goes into what kind of data you give in, you give it to, or other details, and what your um, insight is. That's kind of, I think, very ironic because, in some sense, I think it's becoming more and more intuition driven. In some sense, or maybe I guess giving inductive bias to model is also intuition driven too. But yeah, anyways, also intuition and like more engineering driven. But still, like those. Intuitions are, of course, coming from very strong foundations. So um, I'm not saying that the uh, mathematical foundations are not necessary, but definitely there was such movement since 2017. So I'll be dissecting the model a bit. So let's take a look. So. I think let's first take take away what you are probably pretty familiar with. Okay. So I'll use blue familiar, right? So I, I'm pretty sure now you're pretty familiar with what it means to embed inputs, right? Pretty clear. And I think this is because sick to sick output embedding is quite clear too. Basically you're feeding in the previous, in, previous output to the input or you're shifting the, um, the target if they're given during training time. So probably this is pretty clear. Um, and output probability is basically decoding one word, at, one word at a time. So this is probably clear too. And softmax, of course, you're doing that to make that into probability distribution. And linear is probably also clear for you too. So I'll just make this into one circle. Okay, so just looking at these three, it looks like very similar to the original sick to sick, right? So where are the difference? So number one, there is no RNN. And that's basically making the model entirely, I would say, mm, I would say the position invariant. So model will be will not be able to distinguish between original input and when the original input is completely shuffled, if you just use attention, right? Because there is no dependency between the words. And you're not using something like conversion neural net that depends on the nearby distance. So that's why you put positional encoding. We'll take a look into that soon. And you'll see that from the input side, if this was the sick to sick, you'll put RNN, right? But then instead of RNN, which is sequentially going through every input word, here they put what's called multi ad attention. And they put some add and norm and they to do the feed forward network and add a norm. Add a norm is basically the, um, you add, just like simply add the input and the output of that layer, multi add attention, that's called residual connection. They put a really fancy name on the, 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 the adding act, the act of adding. So it, it, you know, it makes your paper looks fancier and more, more professional though. I mean, at the end it's just adding. And normalization, norm here is referring to layer norm. So we'll not be going into layer norm really much, but um, probably when we have time later, basically you're, it's helping you to basically regular, regularize the, the model, basically not overfitting. And, and in, in reality, actually these days, it's not really also only about overfitting, but also it's preventing the model to go into more of a local minima. That's bad, bad minima. And feed forward is pretty straightforward, right? Just basically you um, map this to, you basically do a linear transformation and have some activation and another linear transformation. So 
I think you're also familiar with this. At a norm, I hope that you're, now you get what that means. It's a pretty simple thing, right? So I'll just put circle on that. So I think what really remains is multi-ed attention on the encoder side. And there is a, some, and same, the same thing happens on the decoder side too. It's basically just uh, you're doing the same thing, but you have uh, access to both encoder and decoder. But a bit different thing here is that mask and multi-head attention. So why is it masked? I'll explain that too. But once you get these, then you have a full understanding of how transformer works. And the problem means that you have a, I think, uh, you know, how to probably, you, you will soon after next lecture, you'll be able to implement transformer from scratch yourself too. So that's the objective of the today's lecture and next lecture. Yep, so let's take a look into each of these. And by the way, look at the, the um, this n times. Means that we have a n layers, not just one layer. Um, it turns out that uh, the original transformer had six layers, n equals six. These days like BERT or even like a GPT-3, they have like much larger n. Okay, so first thing. So let's take a look at how the self-attention works. And before that, do you remember how the attention worked in the our previous encoder decoder? So I hope that you remember this. This is like a, how you compute similarity function between SI minus one and HJ. So it doesn't matter what SI I, I minus one HJ are because they're symmetric in this function. Basically you have a current time step decoder I know I'll say the previous time steps hidden state and the each encoder input. So this is originally this was prev decoder hidden state. And this is the each encoder output. So basically you're comparing between decoder and decoder each decoder time step and the encoder time step. So you're comparing between them and you try to compute that using this function. And this is this works pretty well. This works pretty well. Basically you do linear transformation, additive linear transformation between SI minus one HJ. And then you perform the 10H activation function. And then you multiply that by weights. And remember that this these were the weights, right? These are trainable weights. But what's the issue with this mechanism? I think I mentioned in the lecture that there is a problem, but we didn't go into details, right? The issue actually here is that if you want to compute this in a parallel way, then it will be very GPU inefficient, memory inefficient. So why is that? Just a second. Okay, so suppose that I want to compute this for arbitrary number of um, source sequences and uh, no, the, the, the decoder sequences and the each encoder output. I mean, in this case, of course, we're computing the between each decoder and encoder. So it's a bit different but then if you want to use this for the exactly same setup on arbitrary uh, computing attention between two sequences, I mean, if you're a self attention, then basically you're computing on itself, right? So suppose that I define, okay, let, we want to do self attention. So what we want to do is basically, we want to compute the relevance between basically each time step of the input, right? So what that means is we want to draw something like this. If we're performing self-attention, we basically have a um, say. Like let's say that the input is five word. Then um, there is a input word um, 
there are five input words. Then basically we want to compute the basically obtain some heat map between these, right? That's like basically attention because from the perspective of X3, which words are important? So there are some really important words, maybe. And maybe less important words. For from the perspective of X2, maybe there are some important words. I'll just put more black and less important words. So we're trying to compute the what's this affinity score between each word pairs. So in, in other words, we're basically computing, let's say these are the, um, then basically we want to compute what? Basically, let, I'll use H because these are the words, but we have probably want to compare with the hidden states. So I want to basically compare what is affinity between H, J, and we're defining this to be in the same way Right? Do you agree? Then if we want to compute this in a parallel way, then what we have to do is basically we have to compute, we have to basically do outer product between H, I and H, J. So what that means is that because then in that case, we're assuming the H is the dimension of the, okay, my bad. So I'll define H to be the matrix of the outputs, the hidden states. Let's say this is the H and this is will be in the dimension of what? The time step T times the dimension D, right? Then if you want to parallelize the computation of all these attention, the, the attention weights, then what you have to do is you have to create additional dimension of the H. You basically have to create H prime. I'll actually call it H, H1, which is basically you expand one dimension And then basically just um, tile it in, I would say um, tiling, I hope you get what that means, but you have to basically extend, expand that dimension and then create a super big matrix. It's a bit hard to describe in mathematical way, but you basically have a two matrix. And in the first case, the expanded dimension is this one. And in the second case, expanded dimension is this one. And basically apply these two, the, our scoring function. And then if you apply H1, H2 to the W and UA, then you will be getting exactly, so this will be, basically exactly right then if you do 10 h and you multiply that with the the transpose of a va of course um, you have to do some batch dimension expansion to make this work but this basically will be in the last case This will be basically just last last dimension will be t times t, right? You will just get rid of d by inner product with the, the VA. So the point is that you have to actually create a super large matrix to compute this in parallel. And that's this part. And they'll be super large if t is large, right? In other words, your memory complexity will be over t squared d. You remember these numbers because uh, we'll get back to this in the later stage. But even if you don't get what this means, it's fine. I mean, if it, I think this is uh, for people who are relatively familiar with the how the uh, attention mechanism works. But uh, 
really wanted to know why is the case that this mechanism is not efficient, but if you're not, then for now, just think of it as, okay, doing this way is very memory inefficient. So a bit more memory efficient way actually is from a concurrent work from Long et al, 2015. And they propose a more GPU memory efficient method, which is a really simple method, right? You basically just do memory of the matrix multiplication between the two H's. So um, in the same notation, basically what we are doing here is that we compute, what was the notation here? Basically we're computing And we're saying that this is the affinity will be obtained by doing the multiplication between HI and some weight and HJ. And why is it efficient? Because if we have a really efficient memory, uh, not memory, efficient matrix multiplication, then if you want to parallelize this, we do parallelization. Basically, we define H, right? This is in the real number of a T times D. Then what we can do is we can just simply basically H W H T, right? Because A W will be just D times D and H is T, T times D. So H transpose D times T. So it will be um, T times D D times D and D times T. So at the end, what, we, what do we get? We get T times T, right? Actually, to be more consistent, right? And we're getting the same number from here. What we wanted to is basically this real number of width size T times T. And we're getting this exactly same affinity score between the two. But in that case, even if we are, we are, I mean, it, we can utilize super efficient matrix multiplication that will have very less, very small memory overhead. And even if we have really bad matrix multiplication method, the 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 um, multiplication here will be, of course. Um, what is it? Uh, at the end, yeah. So it will be basically the at the end will not, you know, using too much memory with the this kind of method. So we we do not we never occupy basically this much. T square of D. And wait, I wanted to say one more thing. Um, Yep, that's right. So because um, because you compute this sequentially, then you're only occupying t times d initially, and once you multiply w to h, then it becomes t times d, right? This is t times d. So your memory is t times d, and you multiply d times t, which is h transpose, then you get to t times t, but you never store a super large matrix, which is t times t times d, t squared d. So that's where the memory efficiency comes from. And you actually, Notice that when you're doing this on your GPU to, to compute that you will actually see you, your GPU memory is getting occupied so much more if you use the uh, better now at all attention mechanism, which is also called additive attention mechanism. Although back then we called it additive attention mechanism, but nowadays people rarely use it. So when you say attention, the, the, the standard has become more of a long at all attention or to be more exact, to be more precise, it's a transformer attention mechanism. So that brings us to how the transformer attention mechanism works. And as I've told you, it's very similar to how Lung et al works, 
but there's a scaling factor. It's just for basically because they, because they, that was coming from the observation that long arrow works pretty well when the size of the dimension size is small, the D is small, but then when they tried this with large D, they showed out, saw that this doesn't work well. And their explanation was that, oh, this is because when D gets large, then inner product is so large that it becomes very saturated. So they instead made sure that they divide the, the, the inner product value by some number that's proportional to actually square root of the dimension so that they can take this into account. And another thing that we need to be, um, we also need to know is that in the Loon et al, they try to put the W in the middle. So in that case, then there's only one ways to learn. But another way to think of this is that, okay, why not do this way, right? You basically, if you have H, then you basically transform this into H1, which is H times some W1. So W1 is a D by D matrix. So you have some transport position there. Not transport, you have some, uh, you basically have some, uh, I'll say, transformation, linear mapping. And you can do the same thing for the, the other side, right? H2, which is H W2. And what if we just multiply these two? Then it will be H1, H2, T, which is basically H W1, W T, H T, right? And here, what I want to say is that because you are matrix multiplying two back two matrix here, and these two are both learnable. So actually this is, if you're mathematically, this is actually equivalent to just having one weight in the middle because it's only giving more restrictions. I mean, W has, more freedom than it the, than the requirement. I mean, not, not exactly. Actually, it can be anything. They're basically, if you're learning both at the same time, then why don't you just learn the multiplication of both, right? So there is a, this difference. Uh, that's what I meant that the uh, long et al was one-sided trans linear transformation, but um, in transformer, they transform both sides, which means they have W1 and W2. Um, but then, so you might think, why, 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 why do that? Do that? Why do they do that this way? And one, one thing definitely is, that, I mean, there's no reason not to because it doesn't really add much cost. You will see this when we're working, work, walking through the code. Um, so for now, think of it as, okay, why not? And by doing that way, basically, you can think of it as you have a original H here, and you make Q, K, and V by this all individual transformation. I'll just be consistent. WK and WB, right? Yep, so that's how you obtain this QKV. And now you get why they are QKV because it's basically similar to how the memory works, query key and value. So when you're computing the attention weights, you're using the query and key, and then there you're comparing those to their inner product scores to obtain the attention values. And then you're using attention values to actually access the values. Now I'll not use values actually. So you're computing attention weight from Q and K, and you're using attention weights to access to the values exactly the same way that we did with the, um, how the decoder works. I mean, the original encoder decoder with attention works. So I think now you get all these, right? So you know what these are, you know, MetMol is basically just there, you're computing the, you know, the inner product between them and there's a scaling factor. Mask is just optional thing that we'll see why we need that. Softmax, apparently you need that because you have to actually ob obtain the attention, which is sums to one. And then you basically perform metmol to obtain the um, values, access the values. 
So, mathematically, this is how it works. So actually, we're gonna have a short break, three minute break at this time. We'll come back to this and try to explain this equation at, at three, I'll say 27. And we'll, we'll spend the rest of the lecture on the other parts, which is really about multi ad attention and some details about the decoder. Yeah, so see you in three minutes.
All right, so let's get back to the uh, QKV. Just a second, actually. All right. So how does this work? So I think you remember that QKT, this is very similar to the Luong attention. Right, because let's say the the hidden state was H, then we're saying that the Q is exactly H with some linear transformation. So let's say that was a WQ and we're saying K is H with the uh, linear transformation of K, then of course, then um, QKT is equal to HWQ WKT transpose and H transpose. And I told you that this is very, uh, and that because they're both learnable, then it's same as, almost same as making this into W. There are some differences though, but for now, so let's think of them, think of it as a very quite similar. So, and this is, and that's this. So, how about the square DK? So DK is basically the size of a, so here uh, we're saying that Q, K, V, R, or dimension in T times DK. The reason why they call it DK, I'll, I'll tell you what, why that's so, so you can think of it as a the hidden state dimension, but they have different, um, what, is, what do you call? They have different notations for the, this dimension and multi at attention. But for now, so you, you, you see that uh, this is to prevent the case where QKT is sometime too big. That's why you're dividing that by the, the square roots of uh, DK. And softmax, hopefully all of you get what that means. And for some of you who have some confusion about why you're multiplying V here, because basically softmax will give you a tension value, right? So what this gives you is basically, what's the size of this? QKT was here, QKT will be the size of this will be T by T, right? So basically, this is softmax of this is also t by t. But the important thing is that if the softmax is applied on the second dimension, then we know that the probability distribution, basically the summation will be one on the axis two, second axis. So here, this is a softmax is applied. So which means this is probability distribution with summation of one, and you're multiplying that by T of D, K, right? So then if you matrix multiply this two, then what do you get? T of D, right? But this T of D is basically after you apply the attention, so some focus is happening here. So you're focusing on some parts of it with this probability distribution on the second axis. And then you're outputting the, the final attention values. That's why you're multiplying V here. So you get this at the end. So that's your final output on this attention layer. And from the perspective of V, basically this is, it's a, they have a, you have, you're basically transforming with the same size in the input and the output because what goes into the attention can be considered as you're computing the attention of a V 
given Q and K, that's like probably a better way to think of it. Semicolon is given, right? And you are mapping that to some value that's exactly same size as the input V. They're both a uh, dimension of T by D, T by DK. Hopefully, so all of you got the point here. So what are the benefits of using the this kind of attention compared to, I would say, recurrent or convolutional neural network? So let's first take a look at the complexity per layer. So here, actually, sorry about getting the uh, different notations. So here, the n is actually the length of the sequence. So n here is basically the same as the t that we were just talking about. But I'll use n here just because the original paper used n. So self-attention is n squared d exactly because where is the bottleneck happening here in the previous time step? The bottleneck is happening at the matrix multiplication, which is be between Q and K transposed and the, um, the attention weights and the values, right? So you have to compute two matrix multiplication, self-attention is. One is you are multiplying between T by D and D by T, right? Actually, sorry, I used T again. Yeah, n by m by d and d by n. So, what is the complexity of computing this matrix multiplication? Hopefully, you remember that from um, your intro computer science class. This is exactly the O of n squared d. So, whatever comes here and here and here, multiplication. So, it's always. If you're multiplying this by BC, then this is time complexity will be always O of ABC. So note, right? And then, and then the second thing, which is computing computing this one, Right. Which is a bit different. But they also have O of n squared d, right? Because n times n times d. The first one was n times d times n. So what is that? So the complexity of self-attention is clearly n squared times d. And this is a bit different from how the recurrent neural networks because recurrent neural network doesn't have a square on the n's n, but they have square on d because they have to compute um, the basically standard, I would say, feed forward on itself, right? So of course, um, at the end, self-attention also has uh, this component because they have to do feed forward. So, but it's just, just the self-attention part is, I would say different from the recurrent. And convolutional turns out to be K times N times D squared, it's similar to recurrent, but they have a K because of the kernel size. And self-attention with restricted, I would say length has R and D because in that case, then you're attending on only restricted span from the current time step. So you're multiplying by N instead of R, you're multiplying, multiplying by R instead of N when you're computing self-attention. And sequential operations is, is basically how much it's, it can be parallelized and convolution, convolutional neural nets and self-attention are both fully parallelizable. That's why it's O of one, where R and N is clearly O of N because everything, every time step depends on the previous time step. And maximum path length is exactly, the point here is that 
it's basically it's exactly the point of uh, the, the, you remember the problem of the, sorry, the summarization issue, the basically you have to summarize the entire word, words into um, one vector. It's basically the, the, what you're, they're trying to measure here is that how much steps you have to go through, how many time steps you have to go through to reach the, the vector that you want to access. And apparently in recurrent neural nets, if you want to access the first, ti first time step word from the last word, then you have to go through every word in the input, which is O of n. But in self-attention, you have a direct access, so that's why it's O of 1. And convolutional neural net, you can apply log, log many times of convolutional neural networks to get to that point. But um, yeah, that's so, so it's not that many, but definitely not O of 1. And in self-attention restricted, it's not O of 1 because everything is not connected, only um, the local neighbor is connected, but you can obtain the number by dividing the m by r. So hopefully you get this too. So I wanted to mention that, let me see. Yeah, so don't worry about the self potential restricted for now. This is more of a, the, the point is that if you have really long sequence, then you don't want to compute the attention on the everything, but rather you want to only compute the attention on nearby words that's within the distance of R, then you can be more efficient. But that's um, that we have to be careful about that when we have super long input. But if your input is something like 30 words, 40 words, then you can think of it as just self-attention, regular self-attention. So that's good. So next topic is multi-head attention. This is really important transformer because we just discussed how we can compute the attention, single attention. And that means that each time step for each attention layer, you are attending on probably one thing. Softmax is very, very uh, spiky. So it's very hard to attend on several things. Even if you try to attend on several things by using some temperature, in, in that case still, you have issues with um, you're averaging the outputs or the attention values, that's the definition of attention, right? So you'll be, your attention values will not be good enough. So the problem is that single attention can only focus on one part of the sequence. So we want to basically focus on multiple parts of the sequence. And that was a really main point of multi-attention. And I think personally, one of a really important advancement that Transformer has made and basically what that enables us is that we, have, we can actually model really complex relationships with relatively few layers and also just with attention without using the recurrent neural network. So how does that work? It's actually quite simple, um, in, at least in, in, in intuitively. So this diagram explains everything. So you just do this, uh, the, the same at the attention mechanism that we discussed in the previous slides, like this one. We just do this. But we do this, uh, I would say, multiple times with different weights. So we can do that easily, right? Um, we have a attention with the first head, we call it head. So this is head number one. We have a second head and third head. So we compute that all that independently up to the, up to this equation output. So this attention QKV. Once we obtain this attention QKV output, because then if we just do this iteratively, then we're gonna basically, you know, we have a multiple hats at each layer. So in the first layer, we'll have a three outputs, but if you do this, the same thing for each output, then you will have a nine outputs in the second layer and et cetera. So it'll, it will be growing exponentially, which is bad. We don't want that. So what we do is that after we kind of branch out with the self-attention, we basically concat that and make that into original size again. So if we have three heads, then what that means is that um, we want to basically, um, what do you call, concat that and then make a linear transformation again to basically combine the results again. Quite simple, right? So 
the, the equation can be a bit tricky, but if you actually give a careful look, it's quite simple too. So the multi-hat QKV is exactly, you are concatenating the attention outputs, and then we have a small linear transformation with WO. And that WO uh, is just for um, some transformation that you might need after you concatenate, because before concatenation, they're all independent. So you just give some linear transformation. But the output of each hat is exactly just same as what we just saw, right? From the previous slide. You, you, you remember what this was, right? You basically have this Q, 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 W, Q, K, W, K. Um, so exactly the same thing, except that we want to give different, uh, the difference between the attention between different hats. So we give that difference by giving the, the I subscript and we will have different weights for each hat. But other things are exactly the same. So at this point, you just need to know what the concept is. Uh, details, it's better to really look into the annotated transformer and also try it yourself during in your, probably you will not have a dedicated, super dedicated assignment, but assignment two will be covering this a bit. So I hope you get to learn that a bit in your assignment two. Assignment two is not about fully implementing transformer, but part of it basically just self-attention part. And H is number of hats here. But other things I think pretty clear. And little details now on. We have uh, this skip connection and fit forward. So it's just really simple thing. You just, I told you ski connection is nothing more than just addition. So ski connection is basically, um, what is it? Uh, this doesn't happen here. So basically just ski connection is just adding whatever comes out as the output and, and the input. So you just basically add it. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to explain, you know, in easier terms, you just add the input and output of a multi-attention function. Um, fit for network is just a, a, a neural net, your network layer, dense layer. So you have um, um, some input, which is the output of the multi-attention with the add and uh, skip connection and norm layer norm, and then you just multiply that with some matrix multiplication and some weights, and then you do value. Remember this max thing is value, right? And then similar to, and then do another linear transformation and then add bias, simple, right? So that corresponds to this part and this too. And lastly, positional encoding. So, so now we are trying to remove the RNNs. Um, in your assignment, probably you will, I will ask you to use RNN just because it's easier to train. But in self in transformer, they were trying to get away with the positional and the RNNs. And that means that if you use your self-attention, every token is position independent, which means the model cannot differentiate even if the input words are completely shuffled, which doesn't make sense, right? I mean if words are shuffled, then it's not okay because you the people can understand it. So basically in order to give difference between words at different positions, they basically make some fake vectors depending on the position and then make them add it to the word vectors. So that word vectors are position aware in some sense. And in the original transformer, they have this equation. The good thing about this equation is that it can be it's it's periodical, so it's periodic. So which means you can have a arbitrary length of um, encoding number of in, uh, inputs, and you still can have a very unique position encoding. But in reality, these days people rather use fixed embeddings instead of this. Basically, they just have a it's a very simple thing. They just have an embedding for a specific position. So in that sense, then if you have a, a maximum of uh, 512 length input, then you have basically 512 vectors of dimension D. So you just basically instead learn 512 times D. D is like, for, for instance, something like 1024, right? So you just have this matrix that you use for your position encoding instead of uh, this sinusoidal position encoder these days, I would say. But back then, when they were first proposed, they tried to be very, I'll say, 
very resist resistant against really long sequence. And it turns out that anyway, we don't have to worry about that because it won't work when the sequence becomes super long. And there are several ways to actually make the model into shorter sequence. I mean, the, there are several ways to go around the, to handle these long sequences with these models that can only handle short sequences. So nowadays people don't really use the sinusoidal embedding much. Probably there are some work that use it, but not much. Like BERT, for instance, doesn't use sinusoidal embedding. And by the way, just to give some credit, this was, I think, originally trans proposed in the in the end to end neural, net, neural memory networks in 2015 work, 2015 paper by Subatar et al. Attention in decoder side is quite similar. So it just has a one additional layer for accessing the encoder outputs. Um, and that's this one, right? Basically, you see that this, this arrow comes in. So basically, you're doing this really similar thing on the decoder side, except that when you're doing the attention for the query key values, then you can take a look at both input and a decoder. Yeah, you have a question, right? So two questions, okay. One is that I'm curious about the role of the feed forward layer in the architecture. Yeah, so the feed forward basically adds, I mean, without feed forward, then there is no transformation between layers, right? So feed forward basically helps you to transform the values because you have to add some linear layer to make your model different at each layer, right? So attention is more of a, it's telling you what to focus on, but then after you know what to focus on, you have to process some information on top of that. So feed forward is for that. So attention and feed forward have different roles. Feed forward is very important, of course, because they are, I mean, it, attention is more of a, you just, you're telling the model to where to focus on more of. But then after that, you have to do something with that, right? So feed forward is, that giving that role. And of course, the architect architecture itself is quite simple, but that's basically making every difference. So second question, how does transformer keep the positional information when the layer gets deep? Is residual connection enough for keeping this information? Yeah, you can think of it as the residual connection is very critical actually for making this work because without residual, then it's very, you're, you have to go through several steps of a uh, linear transformation and it might really you know make everything very um i would say um i mean the information positional information might be very very weak at the top layers but residual connection basically always makes sure that the encoding stays alive very easily until even if the layers are really deep yeah Okay, actually, so we are um, out of time today. So so in the next lecture, we'll get back to the attention in decoder side. Um, I wanted to say that it's a bit different, but quite similar. And I want to also uh, ask you to read the paper and also the annotate transformer. Um, they are very easy to read. They're very easy to read. And especially given that you had, you know, you, you took this, you basically just had, we had just had a lecture of the about the paper so hopefully you, you can have a really good understanding of the paper and the annotate transformer and so that you can also ask good questions if, if you have in the next class okay so thanks everyone see you on wednesday <laughs>